When I was a teenager, I went to visit my grandfather for Easter. I always dreaded visiting my grandpa's house on my mother's side of the family because he was always a mean, bitter old pain in the neck for as long as I can remember. But in the last years of his life, he got even worse. He had some kind of dementia that made him act extremely strange. I was somehow supposed to be used to him spacing out and mumbling gibberish to himself by that point. But obviously as a kid, there's no adjusting to that sort of thing. It's easy to imagine why I didn't want to spend my entire holiday with him, which amounted to several days and nights at his creepy old house. Even my mom didn't want to go see her own father. Her and my dad always had arguments the night before we left. She was understandably distraught, and looking back on it now, I'm sure there was a lot of childhood trauma she wanted to avoid. My dad was adamant though, always guilt tripping us, constantly telling us how my grandpa didn't have much years left in him and that we would regret it when he passed. Obviously, that fight put even more of a dark shadow over the whole trip before it even started, and once we got there, I knew right away that it was going to be worse than I thought. My grandpa was in rough shape physically, but mentally more than anything. He was very weird. I avoided him as much as I could. But during the time that I was forced to spend with him, I never once saw him get up from his easy chair. He spent most of the time with us just mumbling gibberish to himself while staring up at the ceiling. It was like his pupils were glued to the top of his eyelids and he couldn't have looked down if he wanted to. Needless to say, none of us were very happy campers on this trip, and it still didn't get better at night when we all went to bed. I was given my mom's childhood room to sleep in, and the second I saw it, I started to understand why my mom was a little crazy. In my mom's childhood bedroom was a life-size Easter Bunny costume, standing right across the foot of the bed. I couldn't fathom how my mom was able to sleep here at night. And why the hell did my grandpa keep this thing here? All these unanswered <gasps> questions made me feel even more uncomfortable than I already was. I definitely didn't want to sleep there, but I didn't have much of a choice. My only other option was to sleep on the couch in the living room, but I was too scared of grandpa wandering around in the middle of the night in one of those dementia sleepwalking episodes, so I needed to have a door I could lock just to feel safe. It wasn't easy to sleep in that room though. The costume stared right at the bed, I thought about moving it out of the way, but I was realistically worried that Grandpa would freak out if I altered anything in his house, and I was also less realistically worried that the thing was alive and would wake up if I touched it. For those reasons, I just dealt with it. The first couple nights, I struggled to sleep. I would literally hide under the covers, but on the last night, things were a little different. I was excited about leaving in the morning, which made it even harder to sleep, and that bunny was still there, which also made it very hard to sleep. I couldn't figure out what, but I could have sworn there was something different about it. Whatever it was, I was curious about it. After not sleeping for a few hours, I got out of bed and walked over to it. I looked it up and down, and got really close to see if there were any details about it that had changed. For the most part, I couldn't tell. But for the few seconds that my face was close to its face, I knew, undeniably, I could hear it breathing. It reached out and grabbed me. It then lifted me up in the air and started violently shaking me, all the while screaming like crazy. I'm dead! Please help me! I fought back, but all my blows were softened by the fabric. It was all useless until I managed to plant my feet against him and push him back with all my might. The monster finally dropped me and I hit the ground. I scrambled to my feet while the Easter Bunny staggered backwards. Then, I sprinted out of the room and ran to my parents. I started to explain what was going on, but my mom barely let me get a word out. Mom! Mom! The Easter Bunny is alive! It's alive! Oh my god! I knew this would happen! W what do you mean? Never mind. Let's just go. I'll get your things together. And just like that, we left Grandpa's house in the middle of the night with all our luggage. I never saw him again. He didn't last much longer after that anyway. He died just a few months later. For years, I held on to the secret of what I thought happened. For all I knew, that thing really was alive and tried to kill me, but obviously that wasn't true. Later on, when I turned 18, my mom sat me down and explained the reality. When she was a kid, Grandpa used to dress up in that Easter Bunny costume and stand in her room at night, just watching to make sure she was asleep. And if she woke up, he would attack her. She thought he had stopped doing that when she got older. But when his mental condition deteriorated to the point that it did, that nasty old habit came back, and I had to experience it. That was a lot to take in. It was my own grandfather watching me at night, like a total maniac. It was him behind the mask, and the Easter Bunny scarred me for life. No! 
It's almost time. Mike's gonna be here any minute now. God damn it, I don't want to do this. <sighs> Screw off! Why the hell did I have to be friends with this psychotic incel anyway? Why did I have to agree to this crap? Pick up the phone. Hello? Hello? Hurry the f up! Leave me the hell alone, you piece of crap! I can't stand this imbecile! Stop ringing already! I'm not doing this today with you, you psycho! Damn it! Does this idiot not have anything else better to do? Coming! Hurry the hell up before I break down your door! I said I'm coming! Just give me a minute! What the hell is your problem, you little pew blinker? You couldn't answer the damn phone? I'm sorry, Mike. I must have had it on silent or do not disturb. I bet you don't keep that thought you've been thunderclapping on back page silent! Now, hurry up and let's get this over with! Okay, Mike. I hope you did the Ouija set up right this time. Yes, Mike. I set up the candles and left the music playing, just the way you requested. All right, let's get this show on the road. Mike, I, I, I think we should reconsider- to Shut up! Shut the hell up and put your damn hands on the planchet, idiot! But, but what if we end up summoning- uh, uh, you know. How about you grow a pair of cojones and stop playing games with me, Steph? Okay, oh, okay. Let's just get this over with then. Hmm. What do you think we should ask it first? I don't know. This is your idea. Oh. Uh, is there anybody there? <sighs> oh, crap. Holy crap. Stop moving the damn thing, Mike. This isn't funny. I'm not moving it. I swear. Oh, my God. What the hell is going on? All right, let me ask it another question. Mike, your nose is freaking bleeding. We have to stop. <clears throat> Relax, I'm fine. All right, what, what do you want from us? Oh my God, it's moving again. Okay. I. L. L. It, it read kill. <laughs> what does that mean? Get me a knife! <laughs> Get away from me! <laughs> what the hell is happening to me?
The story was inspired by a case that happened in 1995. The parties involved were two males named Michael and Stefan. Michael lured his friend Stefan over to his bedroom dressed as a shrine to play the Ouija board. The animation pretty much portrays a dramatized version of what happened and what was actually spelt in the Ouija board that night. Michael was eventually sentenced and the case has since been just a deadly tale on the internet. I live in a condo in Tampa with a fairly nice gym near the leasing office that's open to residents 24-7. It's free and less than a minute from my front door, which makes it a very nice amenity to take advantage of whenever I want. Since I work long hours during the day shift as a nurse, I tend to work out at night, and typically by the time I get to the gym, I'm the only person there. But I wouldn't have been half as comfortable being there by myself if it wasn't for my neighbors I saw in there. However, things didn't always pan out that way. On one occasion, just before I entered the gym, I saw a guy through the glass door and immediately sensed that he didn't belong in there. He wasn't working out, and judging by how skinny he was, it didn't look like he ever worked out. He looked like some skinny, mid-twenties African-American male who wasn't wearing any sort of gym clothes, only jeans and a long sleeve t-shirt. He just sat hunched over the bench press without a single weight near him, none on the bar or on the ground. All he did was turn his head to stare at me. I automatically scanned my key fob and started to go inside, but I never opened the door. I stopped myself for a few seconds with my hand on the bar. I had this strong feeling that I should just call off to the gym while he was there, and that's exactly what I did. I walked away, acting like I forgot something, but I never went back that night. I told myself that I'd be fine missing one workout if I went tomorrow. The next day, after an exceptionally mentally taxing day of work, I was looking forward to the stress relief of some physical exercise more than usual. I had my fingers crossed that the guy from last night wouldn't be there. But I was also telling myself that I didn't care if he was there, because I wanted to blow off some steam so bad that I would override my instincts if I had to. Thankfully, the gym was totally empty when I got there. I put my headphones on and started warming up with some light cardio on the treadmill. Everything was fine until I caught something out of the corner of my eye. I saw the same guy from last night pressed up against the glass door. There stood a man with his hands and face pressed up against the glass. My heart skipped a beat as I jumped off the treadmill and turned around to look at him. He was looking right at me with that same creepy look he had on his face the day before. I paused my music and took out one of my headphones, then shrugged at him and mouthed the words of something like, Can I help you? That's when he lifted up his weird bony hand, pretending to hold on to something, then swiped around at the fob reader, as if to tell me he had forgotten his key fob. I considered for several seconds whether I should ignore him or not. I figured he had forgotten his keys in his apartment since I saw him the night before. That's when I walked over and opened the door for him. I then immediately resumed my workout while the man made his way in. He then began pacing back and forth in one spot. It was like he was anxious about something. I made sure to keep my distance as my heart began racing from being startled by the man's presence. I decided to skip out on cardio and just end the night off with some weights. I was only a few minutes into doing some curls when I started glancing over to that guy and noticed that he was again not really doing anything. I had the feeling that he was watching me, but I wasn't able to catch him staring. I tried not to let him get in my head and to just ignore him. Still, I felt the hairs on the back of my neck start standing up as it became clear that he was getting closer. At first, he was just loitering, but then he was wandering, meandering through all the equipment, gradually making his way toward me. I then made up my mind that I was going to call it a night and head upstairs. As I grabbed my phone and got ready to exit, the man ran up and grabbed me. 
We immediately locked into a fight as I pushed him off while yelling for help. I ran to the other side of the gym and began dialing for 911 when the man tackled me to the floor and tried yanking the phone out of my grasp. Again, I tried screaming for help and that's when he tried pinning me down to the ground and immobilized me. That's when I knew I had to fight for my life as there was no one coming to my aid. I fought back kicking and screaming and striking the man out of sheer panic just so he would back off. Luckily, he was scrawny and out of shape and I'm built from all the time I spent at that gym. So after several minutes of fighting, it was clear that he was getting worn out and exhausted while I still had a lot of fight left in me. Eventually, I pushed him off one more time and managed to run off. I looked over my shoulder as I went out the front door and saw that he still hadn't got back on his feet. I ran straight home to my condo and locked the door before calling the police. When they arrived, they took hold of all the security footage, saw what they needed to see, then had that creep arrested the very next day. However, the story doesn't quite end there. As it turns out, when they did a further investigation, they found that he had been stalking several young women in that gym for months. He had been finding out when each of them routinely went, and then started going in after them for the sole purpose of watching and waiting for them to leave, just so he could follow them home. This story was inspired by an incident that occurred on January 22nd at the Oaks of Woodland Park apartment complex in Tampa. A woman named Nishali was exercising alone when she let a man into the gym who had allegedly forgotten his key fob. In the surveillance footage, the man could be seen approaching the victim and attempting to grab a hold of her before getting into a physical altercation. At one point, the man was able to pin the victim down, but as the woman continued to fight, she managed to break free and escape, eventually leading to the man's arrest. The suspect can be seen in the mugshot below. He is currently facing an abundance of charges. I remember the horrific memories that'll haunt me for the rest of my life like it was yesterday. It all started when I was brushing my teeth in the middle of the night, just before getting ready for the movie I had planned to watch, when I happened to get a phone call from my old pal Patrick. Hello? You reached SpongeBob SquarePants? Hey SpongeBob, do you have any leftover sausages? Leftover sausages? Uh, no, Patrick. Barnacles, you wanna come over and find some with me? Patrick, it's the middle of the night. I'm not going out. I'm watching Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy tonight. I don't want to be interrupted again. I would have liked to meet up with Patrick that night, but he should have called me four or five hours earlier. It's just that he's never understood what it's like to have a job where you need to be somewhere in the morning. Of course, I've known this for years, so I shrugged it off and kept on brushing my teeth, which is when I saw the strangest thing. I looked back at the mirror and saw the reflection of Patrick standing right behind me. I spat out the combination of toothpaste, saliva, and other pieces of food stuck between my teeth all over the mirror. P -p patrick is that you? I quickly turned around, but he was suddenly gone. All that there was was my pet snail, Gary, waiting for me to go with him to the living room. Don't scare me like that, Gary! It's freaking 1 a.m. Just meet me in the living room and, and make sure there's enough food ready. I'm so excited to watch Late Night Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. A little while after that first scare, I was finally in the living room eating my dinner and watching Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. How is it, Gary? Tastes good, right? I seasoned it myself. It's not sushi, damn it! It's leftover meat that I brought home from the Krusty Krab! It's so juicy and scrumptious. Shut up! It's not sushi! <sighs> well, you're putting me on edge, you idiot! If you want me to calm down, why don't you stop pestering me and get me a drink? All I was trying to do that night was relax, but it seemed like everyone in Bikini Bottom was trying to disturb my peace. Squidward must be watching another one of those sissy chick flicks again. Ah, Squidward! Cut it out, you big crybaby! I returned to my seat as Gary arrived with a beer. Ah, that 
that's the stuff. Well... Yeah, I'm coping with a drink or two. So what? Well... No way! I'm not calling her and I'm not taking her back. They don't call her Sandy Cheeks for nothing, you know. She ran herself through all of Bikini Bottom. Mm. Yes, I showered when I was with her. Meow. Yes, I cleaned my holes when I was with her. Meow. Leave me alone or I'm gonna turn you into escargot! I know it may seem like it, but my memory of that night is crystal clear. I very much remember only getting about 20 minutes to myself before Gary came back to bother me yet again. Meow. What, Gary? Meow. Hear what? It's probably just the TV or Squidward crying over one of his girly movies again. Don't worry about it. Ah, look! The TV's off! And listen, not a sound- <gasps> That sounds like Patrick! Just that moment, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I thought it was Patrick running past around the corner, but I knew that couldn't be the case. There was no way he could be in my house. He was at home. I'd just been on the phone with him a few minutes ago. It, it couldn't be. But then again, I couldn't deny that I could hear him laughing from inside my house. It was the door to my library. I got up to check on it. When I opened the door, it was pitch black inside. I stepped inside and flipped on the lights. Then, I saw him right there, sitting in my reading chair at the bottom of the bookshelf slide. There was definitely something off about him, but I couldn't pinpoint what it was. That's when I said, Patrick, what are you doing in here? How did you even get in here? Never mind all that, SpongeBob. Come on, slide down here. I have something to show you. Tell me what it is first. Oh, don't be like that, SpongeBob. Trust me, I think you'll find this very interesting. It's something that might have led to Sandy breaking up with you. You're lying. Am I? Fine. I reluctantly slid down the slide to meet him. He had this disturbing <gasps> smile plastered on his face. But for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what this was. Or if it was some kind of sick joke. I remember seeing him holding a very familiar box in his lap. Recognize this, SpongeBob? The box? Yeah, it's your secret box. The one with just the string in it, right? Yes, but it holds something else now. Something even more special than that. Wanna see? <laughs> Alright, Patrick. Let's see what's in it this time. Something inside me told me not to open it, but Patrick was staring at me with those eyes like I'd never seen before. I knew I had to, or he would never leave, but nothing could have prepared me for what I saw inside that box. Ah! It's Squidward's nose! <laughs> Batman, run for your life! Ah! A few years ago, my friend Donald invited me over to his house to spend the night. It was the weekend, and we didn't have anything else better to do than play board games all night, as neither one of us could afford a video game console. Throughout the night, we spent countless hours in Donald's living room playing games like checkers, chess, and connect four, until we eventually got tired of it. I remember Donald's mom going to bed early, which meant we had most of the whole house to ourselves to do whatever we wanted. We ended up digging through the junk closet by the kitchen, which was full of a lot of miscellaneous stuff like spare blankets, home appliances, childhood toys, and stuff like that. Among all the mess was a stack of weird, knockoff board games that Donald didn't even know he had. But at the bottom of that stack was an Ouija board. I'd never seen one in person before, so it gave me the creeps. Donald then pulled it out saying we should use it. I argued against it at first because I didn't think we knew what we were getting ourselves into. But Donald was persistent, reluctantly. I agreed to try it at least once since we were going to call it a night soon anyway. We set the Ouija board on the kitchen table and lit some candles around it. All the lights were off, and as far as the living were concerned, we were the only ones in the whole house who were still awake. We put our hands on the planchette and Donald told me to ask the first question. I was trying not to take it seriously, so I jokingly asked the open air if Donald was still a virgin. After a few seconds, the planchette started to move. 
At first, I thought Donald was pushing it, but then I knew that couldn't be the case because it wasn't moving towards no, and he would have definitely lied to protect his ego. Then, he told me to knock it off, but I told him that it honestly wasn't me either. Slowly, the planchette moved all the way across the board and stopped right on top of the word yes. We both knew that that was the truth, and I knew that I hadn't been cheated, so for the first time I started to feel legitimately disturbed. Of course, we laughed it off like it was still the joke it started out as. Then I thought for a second that we would be smart and just quit while we still could. But that's when Donald moved the planchette back to the center of the board and said we should keep going. Then, he blurted out something I never expected him to say. Should we become serial killers? My jaw immediately fell to the floor, and I looked at him in disbelief. However, before I could say anything about it, the planchette started to move again. I wanted to take my hands off of it, but it felt like they were stuck, like they were being dragged outside of my control. And of course, the board replied once again with yes. I looked Donald dead in the eyes and shook my head seriously, basically begging him to stop. But he didn't. He asked another question. Who should we kill first? There was almost no delay in the response this time. I watched in horror as the planchette slid back and forth across the board, spelling the word, Mom. Suddenly, Donald ripped his hands away and I did the same. Then we were stuck staring at each other in a terrified silence for what felt like hours. Even the temperature in the room seemed like it had fallen by 10 degrees. Finally, one of us broke the spell of quiet saying, We have to do it. What? Are you crazy? No, we don't. Yes, we do. The board said so. You're kidding, right? It's just a stupid old board game. Shh, don't say that. It's more than that. We have no idea what we communicated with. Depending on what it is, we may not have a choice. Dude, are you really going to take out your mom? I'm not going to. We're going to. You're lying. You're joking. You, you can't be serious. Unless you're willing to admit you cheated, I'm dead serious. Now come on, get up and do this with me. I was left dumbfounded at the table while he got up and grabbed two knives from the counter. Then he put one in front of me. The look in his eyes dispelled all hope that he was messing with me. Still, I didn't want to believe what was about to happen. In that moment, I was more scared about what he would do if I said no. He looked crazy. I went ahead with it at first, grabbing the knife and following him upstairs, waiting for him to turn around at any point and say that he got me, but he never did. We got all the way to the doorway way to his mom's bedroom where we could see her sleeping. I realized that if Donald actually did try to go through with this, that I would be the only person who could stop him. It would be up to me to take him out with the knife if I thought he was really about to do it. But then, it was like he'd become frozen. He looked over to me and I was able to see just how afraid he really was. Second thoughts were all over his face. Man, I can't do this. You go first. Not a chance. I didn't even want to do this. This was your idea. It wasn't my idea. It was... It was theirs. Who's the evil spirit? Get over yourself. That thing's not real. For a moment, I thought I was finally getting to him. But right as we were about to take it all back, that's when we realized we had already crossed the point of no return. It came like a crash of thunder over our heads, with a voice saying, Hurry up and do it! <laughs> this story was inspired by an incident that happened in 2007. Two male individuals named Joshua and Donald played the Ouija board one night and asked it a series of questions as shown in the animation. No one knows if it was merely a case of a mental breakdown or an external entity coming into the equation that caused what happened to happen. The culprits were then later arrested and convicted for their heinous crimes. I've been working as a successful personal trainer for a while now. I run my programs at the LA Fitness just a few minutes from my house. My client base is actually pretty diverse, ranging from the average person just getting into fitness to the elderly trying to stay active, and even people with obesity who are trying to turn their lives around. Even as an exceptionally fit female, it's very rare that my clients ever try to hit on me, with the exception of one person. He was one of my clients who was working on his obesity. For the sake of the story, I'll refer to him as Chris instead of his real name. I'd been training him for a couple years. He started out as one of my worst cases, probably the most overweight individual I'd ever seen. 
But for as bad as his condition was when he started out, he made more progress than anyone else. He was incredibly motivated, but unfortunately for the wrong reasons. He never talked about his progress unless it had to do with looks. In reality, I don't think he cared much about his health at all. After a while, it became clear that the real source of his motivation wasn't about bettering himself, but about his obsession with me. He was extremely weird around me all the time, very starey and suggestive, always asking me to promise him that I would let him take me out on a date if he lost another 50 pounds, another 100 pounds, and so on. I always curbed that behavior, but the more weight he shed, the bolder he became. The problem, however, and anyone who knows anything about extreme weight loss knows this, was all the excess skin that started developing all over his body. I see it all the time, so it shouldn't have grossed me out as much as it did. But then again, I've never been so close to it before. On one of our sessions, Chris mentioned how he hit another milestone saying, Hey Mindy, I'm officially under 350. Isn't that amazing? Yes! I'm so proud of you, Chris. No, no, you should be proud of yourself. This is all thanks to you. He got in the habit of taking me by surprise with extended bear hugs where he'd squeeze the life out of me. It always felt like I was getting swallowed up by all of his excess skin. I'll never forget the feeling of having all that flesh of another person draped over me. Hey, Mindy, why don't we celebrate with dinner? Chris, I've said it a million times. It would be unethical to date one of my clients. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, I want to reach the end of my journey so that I'm not your client anymore. Then we could date. Uh, sure. But I'll have to get surgery to remove all this excess skin first. Once I get that, I'll be able to see what I'm doing in bed. <laughs> uh, right. Chris was my only client that gave me that kind of unwanted attention, so I was able to tolerate it for a long time. As annoying as he was, I was genuinely proud of him. And I didn't want to break his heart and send him back into whatever depression got him to be so big in the first place. He then got on the treadmill and started with some light jogging as I instructed. With every stride forward, I could see his excess skin flopping around, like someone shaking out a blanket. Our goal was to get him under 300 pounds so he could get the skin removal that would bring him down to 250 or less. Then at that point he would start taking care of his own routine. It was around the time he was getting very close to the 300 mark when my birthday started drawing near again. Chris liked to gift me things, and this year was no exception. I was spotting him doing some shoulder presses with dumbbells when he suggested that he buy me an expensive purse. I told him not to spend his money on stuff like that and get something special or meaningful. He seemed to take my suggestion well and carried on working out. On the day of my birthday, I had an appointment with Chris. When I first saw him, I noticed he was carrying a box covered in wrapping paper. But what really drew my attention was something else entirely. I couldn't pinpoint it right away, but there was definitely something different about him. He looked tired, but at the same time significantly slimmer than the last time I saw him. That's when he greeted me by saying happy birthday. I asked him if he ended up getting the surgery, to which he responded vaguely, mostly beating around the question and changing the subject back to my birthday. Chris then handed over the gift and asked me to open it. I took it and started tearing off the wrapping paper. I then lifted the lid off the box, and to this day, I'll never get the image of what I saw out of my head. As soon as I saw it, I felt so weak that I dropped the whole thing, causing the contents to fall on the floor. It was a bag, all right, but it wasn't designer or any name brand that existed. Chris had made it himself, out of human skin, his own skin. That's when Chris held up his shirt, showing off the fresh scar on his stomach. Chris then said with a grin on his face, I wanted to give you a piece of me. I ran away in terror. I got to my car and threw up in the parking lot, then canceled the rest of my appointments. After that, I drove home and got wasted to try and erase the memory, but it was pointless. The traumatization was already done. I texted Chris that I could no longer work with him, then I blocked his number. Since then, I haven't seen him at the LA Fitness, and even though that means he's probably sitting at home and doing all the work he did, I don't care. I'll be thankful to never see him again. I'd just fallen asleep when they woke me up. 
I was surrounded by three individuals wearing a purple, yellow, and red animal-like costume. They looked weird and decrepit, like they didn't belong on this planet. However, as I looked down at my own hands, legs, and body, disturbing revelation dawned on me. I, too, was one of them. <gasps> I couldn't explain where I was or what was going on. I then rushed to my feet and joined the others as we were standing in the middle of nowhere. It was just an open land of hills, a windmill, flowers, trees, and bushes surrounding the area. I even saw an underground house embedded in the middle of the field, but I didn't know who was living in it. As I glanced into the distance, it didn't look like there was any form of civilization close by. And even if I wanted to run away, it didn't look like any person could make it far without the consequence of suffering from dehydration and starvation. That's when I yelled, What the hell is going on? Where the hell am I? But right as I turned around, I saw it. There was a giant sun hovering before me. That's when those three other entities started hailing and bowing to it, like it was some kind of god to them. I remained silent, not knowing the consequences that could come with speaking out of turn. A few minutes later, the windmill began blowing some kind of pink fairy dust in our direction. I don't know what it was, so I covered my mouth and nose with my hands. I could see the others on their knees inhaling the dust like they were enamored by its benefits. <laughs> more! Give us more! We want more! Salatoten Land is so awesome! Thank you for blessing us, son, baby! We want more! <laughs> The windmill just kept going. It didn't stop rotating and spraying whatever particles into the air. All I knew was that it couldn't have been anything good due to the bizarre and erratic behavior of these figures. Those strong pink winds surrounded the area, making it inevitable that whoever was within its parameters would feel the effects of its deadly effects. What's happening to me? That's when I lost total control and fell to my knees with my arms dropping to my sides. I was now in in their world. I felt as if there was no possibility of an attempt to escape with the state I was in now. It was almost as if I was trapped in an unwanted deadly trance that would never go away. That's when it all became clear to me. I now knew why they were acting this way the whole time. The so-called baby son was now visible to me. That's when I dropped down to my knees and joined the others as we all hailed at the baby son in unison. Now that I had become one of them, I realized that there was no turning back. I knew that I was held in captivity, but at least I had my fellow companions to experience the trauma with me. From that point on, there was a trumpet that rose from the ground every so often, announcing orders and telling us what and when we could eat, what we could do, and when we could sleep. Pretty much our livelihood depending on it. And speaking of food, there wasn't a farm or anything around. All we could eat was the grass, leaves, and flowers that we picked off from my either the ground or trees nearby. There wasn't any meat or any source of protein, which forced us to all be vegetarians. We would eat and then play a few rounds of hide and seek with the baby son by hiding behind the hills. There were times in the night where I would sleep by the hill alone and contemplate making a run for it, but I knew that there was no way in hell I was going to survive out in that distant land. Whoever or whatever was running Teletubby land knew to always keep the windmill running and blowing the fairy dust, keeping us vulnerable and weak. But with the countless days, weeks, months, even years of just flowers, grass, and leaves, I started driving into insanity and began plotting against my so-called brothers and sisters. I didn't care about them or the baby son anymore. I just wanted for that sun to set before I could make my move. I grabbed a tree branch and sharpened the end, making it ready to commit the act. When the coast was clear, it was finally nighttime. I peered above the hills looking amongst the sleeping Teletubbies. When the time was right, that's when I ran up on them. Ah! Ah! He's gone, psycho! Somebody help me! Help! Shut up, you stupid little triangle head! You forced me to do this! I must sacrifice you, Lala! And Poe, it's for the greater good! <laughs> and that's when I took them out. All of them. Not a single soul was left in what they used to call Teletubby land. Well, there was still one soul left, but she only appeared in the daytime, so I waited a few hours for her to rise back into the sky. <gasps> Tanky, Winky! Run! 
What have you done? Nothing at all, baby son. Don't, don't cry. Tinky Winky, Lala, and Poe are still here with us. Look, they left you a souvenir. The Teletubbies are still here forever. <laughs> When I was a teenager, my parents would usually visit our relative's house and stay over there during the Easter holiday. I was never stoked about it because there wasn't much to do over there. I told my parents I wanted to stay home this Easter. I was fortunate that my parents were the nicest people on the planet because they allowed me to stay home. As long as I followed standard protocol like not answering strangers, I remember having the entire place to myself. It was nice having some private time. My parents only wanted me to do my chores and finish my homework which was easy enough to comply with. Then, at 1 in the morning, while sitting on the couch watching one of my favorite TV shows, I remembered I had to take out the trash for the garbage men to pick up when it was time for them to drop by the street. So, I gathered up all the trash bags inside the house and diligently brought them out. Then, moments later, a car pulled up in front of the driveway, creeping me out quite a bit. I knew my parents weren't scheduled to come home so soon, so I knew it couldn't have been them. I had no idea who this person was. It was like a silver Honda or something like that. The door and windows remained closed the whole time. The lights were kept on and the vehicle was running while parked in the middle of the street. Then, moments later, I heard the door click. And when it swung open, a person who appeared to be an old hag emerged from the car. Her hair was long, disheveled and gray. She wore a long black dress, staring at me from a distance. Her eyes were blank and round. Then, seconds later, her lips curled into a maniacal smile. I was in shock, my entire body paralyzed by fear. This type of scenario was something I often saw on television. So, having experienced it myself, I didn't think it would stir me up this much. And while my mind was trying to process what was happening, I didn't know what to do. Then suddenly, my heart dropped when the creepy old woman dashed toward me. The old woman was mere inches away from grabbing me before I ran inside the house and slammed the door shut, locking it immediately. The woman then started pounding at the door, laughing like a psycho. Stay away from me, you freak! I'll call the cops! I swear! Despite my doubts, I tried to be more assertive, hoping this crazy old hag would leave me alone. Then, a few seconds later, the banging and laughing stopped. <gasps> I then peeked through the curtains on the window and saw the woman going through my mailbox. I wanted to cuss the lady out but knew better than to open the window, afraid she would suddenly attack me. So, my best option was to call my parents. As I was about to dial my parents' number, I could see the creep still rummaging in the mailbox, giggling like a lunatic. <laughs> There was nothing funny about what she was doing. Maybe she felt like she had achieved something by invading our mailbox. Then, moments later, the creep finally walked away, oddly satisfied by what she did. As she returned to her car, I immediately called my parents and told them everything. My parents were worried and told me to stay put and to keep all the doors and windows locked until they arrived home. That's when I saw the creep finally drive off. I felt like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders, allowing me to breathe again. I sat on the couch and waited hours upon end. With each ticking of the clock, I grew restless, afraid the old woman would suddenly return and back up and decide to break into the house. About an hour later, my parents finally arrived home. They immediately consoled me and vowed to never let me stay home alone again. After telling them what the creep did to our mailbox, my parents looked at each other, understandably confused. That's when my dad decided to take a peek inside the mailbox. But before exiting the front door, my mom was a bit reluctant, afraid the old lady might have snuck a bomb or hazardous device inside it. That's when my parents called the cops to have them investigate it. When they arrived, they cautiously opened it and reached inside. As the officer brushed away the envelopes, setting them aside, he found what appeared to be an Easter egg. 
It was colorful with a splash of pink, yellow, blue, and white. It looked like an ordinary decorated Easter egg. However, as the officer opened it and saw the contents, his expression turned <gasps> sour. When my mom took a closer look, she immediately told me to look away. Moments later, my parents told me that it was a bunch of graphic content hidden inside the Easter egg. There were small photos that were unpleasant and disturbing. Enraged, my parents made a police report and demanded that they find the culprit. A few days after the incident, my parents got an update from the police, telling us that they had identified the woman and that they had taken her into custody. It was alleged that the woman had put the same easter eggs in multiple people's mailboxes around the neighborhood. When the bizarre old lady was being questioned at the police station, she insisted that she had nothing but good intentions and that what she did wasn't a crime. In fact, she justified that the only reason she filled the easter eggs with such graphic content was that she wanted to educate people. Since then, I could never look at Easter the same way again. Whenever I saw an Easter egg, I would always be reminded of that strange old woman staring at me with a sinister smile. This story was inspired by a case regarding a 42-year-old Florida woman. She was accused of placing plastic eggs into people's mailboxes that contained graphic images. It was alleged that she had delivered over a whopping 400 Easter eggs. When they asked why she did it, her answer was that she was trying to educate people. Today marks the 10 years of my marriage with Shaggy. We were once like the American Dream family, except instead of having kids together, we had Scooby. Honestly, I'm thankful to God that I never had any kids with Shaggy. He was cute when we met, but now he's nothing more than a fat, lazy slob who spends his time holed up in his room upstairs, gambling away all the money I make for the household on stupid online poker games. Still, I wish he would help out with something, even if it were just taking care of Scooby. That monster of a dog he was so attached to in college has become an entirely different beast of burden as the years have passed. Shaggy was so adamant about moving him in with us, but as soon as we took that dog out of the mystery machine and off the road away from the rest of the gang, he changed. He's extremely high maintenance at best and downright vicious at worst. We could barely contain him, so the only thing we could do to keep him from causing trouble was to keep him locked in the shed out back, which I did my best to renovate into a semi-comfortable doghouse, but I could only do so much. That Scooby is more like a lion than a dog in more ways than one. I constantly worry about what would happen if he got loose in the neighborhood, and I'm reminded every day just how much that creature eats. He goes through more food than me and Shaggy combined. And that's saying something considering the pig that Shaggy is. Needless to say, the three of us habitually avoided each other, lest the growing hatred between us flare up in endless fighting over nothing. I always find myself wondering what Fred and Daphne are up to, but when I look at my own situation, I get the feeling theirs probably isn't so different. Most nights, I sit in the living room with the lights off and watch whatever junk is on the TV while stuffing my face with bowl after bowl of cereal like some kind of stunted psychopath. I have my giant spoon and bowl, my jug of milk, and my jumbo boxes of my favorite childhood cereal to keep me company. It was like a coping mechanism that reminded me of better times. One night, I was in my usual depression on the sofa, wasting away like always when I got a call from Shaggy on my cell phone. I rolled my eyes and declined the call immediately, even though he's literally right upstairs. It's typical of him to be so lazy that he won't even get up or even call out to me if he needs something. He just calls me on the phone. However, just a few seconds later, he called me again. Annoyed, I put down my spoon and answered it. What do you want? Hey Velma, could you do me a favor and bring that leftover pizza that's in the fridge up to my room? <sighs> Are you serious? Who do you think I am, your maid? Get it yourself, you lazy bum. <sighs> Jeez, I should have known you wouldn't care enough to satisfy me. Oh, I don't satisfy you? What about me, Shaggy? The last time I was satisfied was when that gut off wasn't hiding Calm your- Calm down, Velma. You obviously forget that I am working up here. These poker winnings don't earn themselves, you know. You never win anything. You only lose. I'd have a better chance of winning if I wasn't playing on an empty stomach. You know what? You want your stupid pizza? Fine. I hung up the phone and got up from my seat, 
grab that nasty moldy two-week-old pizza out of the fridge, storm up the stairs, barge into his pigsty of a room, and threw the box in his face. Like, hey, what was that for? Don't play dumb with me, you jerk. You never buy food except for yourself. Yeah, and I win at poker for myself, too. I'm independent. No, you just don't care about your family. You only care about you. Why should I care? Owning Scooby is useless and being married to you is even worse. You lost your curves the day we got married. I honestly can't believe how much you let yourself go. You take that back right now. It's the truth. You used to look hotter than Daphne. Now you just look like my sack after I've been in the bathtub for an hour. You know what the truth is? You need to start buying food for Scooby because he's your dog. He always has been. No, he's not. That's just what everybody thinks. Why am I the only one taking care of him? He's bonded to you and you just neglect him all day. Fine, you're right. I don't care. I don't care about Scooby and I don't care about you either. Does that make you happy? Then. All of a sudden, we could hear Scooby making a ruckus from the backyard. All this time we lived in that house, we never knew that Scooby could hear us every time we fall. If Shaggy had known that, I bet he would have bit his tongue. Because a second later, I heard the latch on the shed break off. The door flew open and Scooby came charging out. He was moving so fast I could feel his thunderous footsteps. Shaggy and I barely had a second to stop fighting and figure out what was going on. But before we could, Scooby barreled through the back door and into the house, then up the stairs and straight into Shaggy's room. We were both frozen still. I didn't move a muscle. But then, all hell broke loose. Scooby jumped and flew through the air, landing right on top of Shaggy, then started mauling him. I've never seen that beast go so totally ballistic. For a moment, I just watched as Scooby tore Shaggy to pieces, ripping and tearing away the softest parts of his fatty flesh and pulling him apart limb from limb. The attack was so brutal and powerful that just by standing a few feet away, I was covered in the blood that sprayed from Scooby's jaws. Slowly, as Shaggy's screams of panic and agony diminished to whimpers and moans, and finally to nothing at all but dead silence, I backed away and hid inside the closet until Scooby was finished with his meal. Now, for the past couple weeks, Scooby's diet has been completely taken care of, thanks to Shaggy paying the ultimate price to supply the meat with his own body. Of course, he got what he deserved. My mother who suffers from dementia has been living with me for the last several years. Her cognitive condition has declined to the point that most nursing homes are reluctant to take her in, or will charge an arm and a leg that neither of us can afford. In a different time, she would have ended up in a mental asylum a while ago. Due to the severity of her dementia, she's prone to violent outbursts and can't function in public. Having to be her day-to-day -day caretaker has gotten in the way of my ability to focus while working from home. I'm afraid to think what would happen if I still had to leave the house to go to the office. As it is, she already thinks I'm dead and refuses to acknowledge my existence in the physical realm. She doesn't watch TV or listen to music, and she doesn't have any hobbies. The only stimulation she gets is from an Ouija board she always has by her side. When she started going off the deep end, the thing just showed up one day, but she always claimed it was a family heirloom from generations ago. That was when she still talked to me. These days, it's like her eyes are shut to everything in the real world, and her hands are bound to that planchette of that Ouija board. She's always sitting at the living room table talking to it, sliding the planchette all over the place a mile a minute, like she's taking down the entire life story of whatever ghost she thinks she's communicating with. If I so much as have the nerve to walk in from the grocery store, or come out of my bedroom and interrupt her focus by just moving around, she won't realize it's me, but she'll think something's wrong and start screaming out some weird esoteric name, asking why it killed me. Why? I know why do you think my son? Why? I don't understand it. It's almost no use trying to reach the real person trapped in there anymore, and definitely not when she's like that. I've tried everything I could think of, but it's like I'm a ghost to her. Mom, why are you crying? I'm right here. Listen to me. Look at me. I'm right here. 
please don't forget about me. At this point, I don't even try anymore. I feel guilty about it. But even if I could afford to get her help, or even if I had any idea how to help people with her condition, I seriously doubt I would do any good. It's far too late to stem the tides, as they say. The most I can do is just let her be. But recently, I swear it's more like she's possessed. I know her brain is deteriorating, but I worry about her soul too. Sometimes, I think she'd be better off with a priest or an exorcism than a doctor and medication, especially at night. She never sleeps as far as I can tell, and quite often the noises she makes keeps me up for hours, and when it doesn't, I can still hear it in the nightmares it gives me. Tonight, it was especially disturbing. I thought I was used to it, but some of the things I heard gave me chills. At some point, even though I didn't want to risk making things worse, I was really in need of a glass of water. While trying not to make any noise, I reluctantly opened the door and stepped out of my room. I then tiptoed down the stairs. I could hear my mother scraping the planchette as frantically as always, pausing to have bouts of wailing, just to go back to asking more questions she doesn't want the answers to. About halfway down the steps, she came into view at the table. I then stopped to watch her from the distance. All the lights in the house were off, so it was pitch black darkness except for the little bit of light bleeding in through the windows from the street lights outside. I then started tiptoeing my way towards the kitchen. It was literally like a scene out of a horror film. I didn't want her noticing me. Just the mere thought of startling her was downright terrifying to me. Luckily, she was facing away from me. So if I could just get the glass of water and get back to my room without making too much noise, I wouldn't set her off any worse. I successfully crept into the kitchen unnoticed and picked up the glass of water that was sitting out on the counter. I made sure I was extra careful not to knock into anything. I put the glass under the tap and braced myself. Turning on the water was the only thing that made noise that I couldn't avoid. My mom was crying softly in the other room, so I figured she wouldn't hear it over her own voice. I turned it on at a quiet level and waited. When I turned off the tap, I noticed my mother had stopped crying. I went completely still, my heart pounding from fear. I could see my mother in the other room out of the corner of my eye, but this time I caught her glaring at me. She had this look of utter hatred on her face. It felt like we were both frozen there for an eternity. Then she snapped her head around and screamed, Why did you take my son? I flinched at the sound of her voice and dropped the glass of water on the tile. I backpedaled as she snarled at me, and for the first time in years, she jumped from the table and ran, charging straight for me. When I turned to run away, I slipped. <laughs> This story was inspired by a case that went down in 2001. An old Oklahoma woman named Carol played the Ouija board and felt like she was receiving a message from a higher power. She then did what she did and has since been taken into custody. What makes this story even more disturbing was how Carol's close relatives have mentioned that she has no history of mental illness or odd behavior. I've only ever had two neighbors since I moved into my own pineapple. There's always been Squidward, the obnoxious, nosy neighbor, and Patrick, the dumb one who's so stupid that he doesn't even live in a real house. My options for friends were limited, so I ended up making the choice to befriend the town moron, but the more I got to know Patrick, the more he surprised me. He's not nearly as dumb as he seems. Everybody knows he lives under a rock, and I'm sure everybody has a million questions about how that works. Where does he sleep? Sleep? Where does he cook? Where does he go to the bathroom? Well, in reality, the answer to all that is connected to what's probably the biggest conspiracy in all of Bikini Bottom, and I'm involved in more than just covering it up. Patrick and I rolled together for years, which made everyone think I was just as stupid as him, but I'm not. I don't crap on my own floor and bury it in the sand like that filthy starfish, but in all this time I've known him, I've buried more than just a few hatchets alongside him. 
However, as time went on, I began to realize I couldn't keep hanging out with him. I was only ever his friend because nobody else would be my friend, and for that reason, I've been slowly creating distance. Unfortunately, that's a lot easier said than done. Recently, Patrick's been catching on to my game, and it's been upsetting him. Just the other night, I was deep asleep in bed when I was woken up by someone banging on my door. It was Patrick, of course, and he was willing to wake up all of Bikini Bottom just to get to me. SpongeBob, buddy! Come on! Wake up! Let's do this! I tried to wait a few minutes to see if he would give up and go away, but that only worked the first few times, not this time. I know you're awake, SpongeBob! Don't leave me hanging! I know you can hear me! I'm not leaving without you! I knew at that point that he would never leave unless I went down there to talk to him, so I dragged myself out of bed and shuffled down downstairs to the front door. When I opened it, I was taken aback by the look on Patrick's face. He was holding a jellyfish net, and when he comes to my door in the middle of the night with one of those, I know what it means. Hey, SpongeBob, wanna go jellyfishing? <sighs> No, Patrick, I can't. Yes, you can. Come on. What's stopping you? It's late, Pat. Can't we do this in the morning? No, no, Sponge. You know we can't. Listen to me. I don't want to do this nighttime jellyfishing anymore. I want to retire from it. How can you say that? We've got such a good thing going, and you're going to make me go back to doing it myself? Look, I'm sorry, but I just don't think the late night jellyfishing life is for me anymore. I'm getting too old, Patrick. I have to focus on my career at the Krusty Krab. Liar! You know you could quit that crummy job in a heartbeat if you just went to work with me. You're choosing to abandon the best opportunity you'll ever have. Why? Because it's wrong, Patrick. It's evil. You are evil. I see. It wasn't wrong when we were doing it together, but now that you don't want to be friends with me anymore, all of a sudden it's evil. I can't believe you, SpongeBob. You better believe it, Patrick. So these are your true colors, huh, buddy? You're a traitor. I'm not betraying you. I'm just moving on. You can't move on. Uh, I won't let you. You better crap your nut and come, or you're gonna realize how big of a mistake you're really making right now. Leave me alone, or I'm calling the cops! I tried to slam the door in his face, but he wedged his foot underneath it, barred <gasps> straight in. I then ran for my life as he chased me into my house. He was close behind me the whole time. Had he gotten a hold of me, he would have tried to kill me without a doubt. I'm sure he wouldn't have even hesitated either. But luckily, I was able to get around a corner and lose him by hiding someplace I knew he'd never seen me before. Oh, SpongeBob, where are you? Come out, come out, wherever you are. I held my breath in silence for an eternity before he finally gave up and left. I waited to make sure he wasn't coming back. Then, I crawled out from my hiding spot and went to my bedroom window to watch him head into town. You see, nighttime jellyfishing is nothing like regular jellyfishing. It doesn't take place in the fields, but on the streets of Bikini Bottom itself, and it doesn't have anything to do with jellyfish at all. A few hours later, Patrick returned with his net sagging with the bounty of a successful trip. The poor soul that he managed to capture, a bound and gagged fish that never saw it coming. Patrick lifted up his rock, looked around one last time, then disappeared beneath it with his newest toy in tow. Nobody on the ocean floor but me and Patrick knows what lies below his rock. Most people think he lives in a barren, dirty hole in the ground, but in reality, that's just the facade for something far greater. With the flip of a switch, he can reveal a hidden tube from the floor, drop his victim inside, watch them get sucked underground, then flip the switch again and make the whole thing disappear. As for the destination of that tube, well, I've only seen it a few times, but you'd be utterly shocked to find out just how many sea creatures live underground as Patrick's captives. It's almost an entire city where all the citizens are subservient to him, giving him everything he wants, even if it's their own flesh for him to snack on. Admittedly, I've added to the population myself, and of course taken part in the spoils as well, but he eventually came to realize the depth of the evil I was committing. And now, all I want to do is forget that I ever contributed to something so awful.
Around the time that this happened, I was a very gullible teenager that didn't have any friends outside of school. My parents were mostly absent from my life, so I got used to entertaining myself and taking care of my basic needs. But it wasn't like I lived in a hard neighborhood that taught me street smarts or anything. I was just a weird suburban loner. During spring break one year, I would find myself wandering around the mall. I wouldn't do much besides window shop and walk around till my legs started cramping up. That's when I saw the Easter Bunny area had already been set up ahead of the holiday. I knew I was a little too old to be getting those kinds of pictures taken, but I guess I was jealous of everyone else who got to go with their parents, which is something I was never able to do with my own. When I got in line, I was moving along at a good pace. I then noticed that most of the kids who were getting their picture taken weren't spending much time with the Easter Bunny. A lot of them were running away screaming and crying after just a few seconds. This however didn't raise any red flags. Just because I assumed it was a bunch of wimpy kids that got coerced by their parents into taking a picture with the bunny. When it was finally my turn, I walked over to the Easter Bunny and heard him say something like, Have a seat on my lap. Let's make this a good memory. I blushed with embarrassment, but I couldn't figure out why, so I just sort of went along with it. There we are. Now smile for the camera. That's when the bunny grabbed me around the waist and shifted me towards the middle of his lap, supposedly to face me in the right direction. However, that wasn't the only weird thing that happened. As the photographer snapped all the photos, the Easter Bunny leaned in and whispered something else saying, Hey little guy, would you like an Easter egg? I made them myself. They're pretty good as long as you're okay with a lot of egg whites. <laughs> Looking back, it was clear that he was taking advantage of the fact that he was wearing a mask and that there was a lot of noise around us so that nobody could pick up on what he was saying. I should have said no, but like I said, I was gullible back then so I said, Sure. Just then, the photographer gave us the signal that he was done. Over already? What a shame. But weren't you so well behaved? I wish the rest were more like you. The bunny then gave me a pat on the back as I got off his lap. But before I could walk away, he whispered to me again saying, <sighs> You're the best one I've had all day, so I'll tell you what. Meet me in the bathroom over there in a few minutes and I'll get you that Easter egg as a reward. Sound good? Um, yeah, thank you. No, thank you. Run along now. I walked past the photographer and got my free photo, then went to the bathroom the bunny pointed out to me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, but I really thought I was about to get some kind of prize or high value gift. The bathroom was empty, so I sat inside one of the stalls at the back end and locked the door while I waited. <gasps> A few awkward minutes passed before I heard the door open and someone walk in. But things got disturbing when I heard them lock the door. That's when I finally got the message that something was very wrong. Whoever it was that came in just trapped me in there with them. I immediately regretted ever doing this and lifted my legs up off the ground to hide. I felt like my heart was going to beat out of my chest. Suddenly, the person kicked open one of the stalls. I nearly jumped out of my skin as that horrible chill ran down my spine. I knew it was only a matter of time before they figured out which one I was in. Stop hiding from me, you little vermin! Don't you want your prize for being so good on my lap? <laughs> That's when I heard them kicking down the stall door right next to me. I was so afraid that I started biting my nails to keep still. Things got quiet except for the sound of my heart pounding in my skull. I slowly looked up, expecting to see the face of the Easter Bunny looking down at me, but he wasn't there. I started to feel the slightest bit of relief, until the most nightmarish sight became reality. I looked down to see him looking up at me from under my stall door. I screamed as he grabbed me by my feet and pulled me off the toilet. I kicked and squirmed and struggled as he dragged me out from under the stall. Help! Somebody help me! Nobody's getting in here, so just shut up! He dragged me over to one of the open stalls and started pulling me into it. In that moment, I was able to pry his fingers off of me and break free and get the hell out of there. I ran to the door and unlocked it, pulling it open and sprinting outside into the mall just in time. Everything else was a blur as the scene developed in the pub. Public, with everybody coming to my aid and finding out what happened, 
the Easter Bunny tried to get away, but obviously he was pretty identifiable and got <gasps> tracked down and arrested within a few minutes. As it turns out, the man who was playing the Easter Bunny was a well-known predator with several outstanding warrants, who managed to lie his way into getting the role, just so he could target more innocent civilians. This story was inspired by a case revolving around a 53-year-old man who lied his way into getting the mall Santa and Easter Bunny gig, just so he could prey on the vulnerable. The image below is a mugshot of the culprit. It was said that he was linked to multiple assaults and counting. <laughs> Hey, Arnold. Welcome back to the shop. It's been a while. Hey, Sal. Sorry I'm a little late for my appointment. The rain slowed me down a little. Ah, that's all right, Arnold. At least you don't need an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm long overdue for a haircut. Got a date with a hot blonde this Friday. She has long legs and a mean unibrow. Well, just make sure when you take a picture with her that you put it on landscape mode. Otherwise, your picture's gonna read, to be continued on page two. Noted. Anyway, how are you doing, Sal? God damn. Look at the size of that thing. What in the hell is this kid's parents feeding him at home? Hello? Can you hear me, Sal? Hey, Arnold. Do you think you overthink sometimes with that big brain of yours? Excuse me? What did you just say? Uh, no, nothing. So, Arnold, how's your day going? It's going good. Just had a long day at school, you know? Usual. That's not the only thing that's long. Uh, I mean, yeah. School can be tough when you're not wide awake. Yeah, one of my classes is boring as hell. I think I have a headache from it. You got any aspirin, Sal? Yeah, how many do you need? A hundred? Uh, no. I, I think the recommendation on the label says once a day, right? You sure, Arnold? You did say you had a headache, right? Yeah? You sure you don't want ten extra just in case? Yeah, I think one should be enough, Sal. Alright, suit yourself. There you go, kid. Thanks, Sal. So, how are things, Sal? I'm surprised that TV still works. Yep, still works. Are you even able to see it, Arnold? I, I know it's not widescreen, so it may be hard for you to see. And why would it be hard for me to see? God gave me two eyes. And he gave you a big, uh, a big, big heart. You know you've always been my favorite customer, right, Arnold? Uh, sure. So... Do you watch any sports? I bet I can guess your favorite sport. Okay, go for it. All right, let me guess. Let me guess. Is it football? Uh, no. I actually hate football, because that's what all the bullies in school call. I'm sorry to hear that, Arnold. Anyway, how's the parents? Did your dad divorce your mom yet? What? No! Why would you even say that? I mean, let's be real. How does he stay happy? With a kid like you, I'm sure she's wide downstairs. What the hell are you talking about, Sal? I don't even have parents. I live with my grandma and grandpa. I'm sorry, Arnold. Listen, you came into the shop to get a haircut, right? How about we get down to business? So, what's it gonna be today, Arnold? What kind of haircut are you looking for? You want the fade with the narrow, uh, I mean, wide taper, or you want the Washington Special? What's the Washington Special? Well, let me have a look at you to see what I'm working with. Damn, look at this thing. What? What's going on? This thing is massive. It's like someone gave you a BBL in your head. Uh, what's a BBL? Bigger, bulkier, larger. What do you mean? I is it lice? What do you see? Uh, no, no, just forget about it. So what kind of haircut would you like, Arnold? Let me think about it, Sal. Give me a minute. I'll give you a five with all that thinking needed. Okay, great. Guess I could go for a faux hawk. Well, that won't look good with my forehead. <coughs> you mean ten head? Sorry, what did you say? No, no, carry on. Well, I suppose I can try the Gordon Ramsay hair swirl. You know what? I'll just get the usual, Sal. Give me a buzz cut. You sure? Yeah. I'm kind of receding in the middle, so maybe give me the two-piece buzz cut special? Pretty sure my date will dig that. All right, let's go for the two-piece buzz cut special then. Let me just put this around your neck and we're good to go. All right. Now please take off your hat for me, Arnold. My cap? Yes, your cap. I mean, you can't just cut around it? No, you have to take it off, Arnold. All right, I guess if I have to. Oh, 
Holy smokes! This right here's no boy! He's an animal! Well, what are you talking about? They must have made you in a lab or something. There's no way in hell I can get the job done with just a razor. Uh, wait right here. Perfect! Found it! What are you gonna do with that? Hey, Arnold! I'm gonna give you the buzz cut of your life! <laughs> There once was a starfish that lived under a rock in a small town called Bikini Bottom, below the depths of the deepest ocean on Earth. This starfish was named Patrick Star, but the only thing he was famous for was his incredible stupidity. The entire town believed without a doubt that the starfish had the lowest IQ out of all the sea creatures, and, of course, none of them were nice about it. Patrick Starr's only friend was his neighbor just two doors down, a filter feeder named SpongeBob SquarePants, who just so happened to live in none other than the finest of pineapples. SpongeBob knew Patrick better than anyone, but unlike the rest of the townsfolk, SpongeBob didn't believe that Patrick was dumb at all. No, SpongeBob was convinced that Patrick was actually a liar. Nobody could be that stupid stupid, he thought, and in all the years they hung out together, he could have sworn he saw the deceptive starfish slip up at least once or twice. Even for somebody as supposedly idiotic as Patrick, literally living under a rock simply seemed too ridiculous to be true. The curiosity burned within him for ages, building and building, till one day he couldn't accept not knowing for sure any longer. And on that day, the very starfish in question invited Spongebob over for dinner. At this moment in time, Spongebob had plans to make this his moment to finally expose the true nature of the notoriously moronic Patrick Star. Patrick, I I'm ready to eat now. Uh... I'd appreciate it if you put some pep in your step, Patrick. If you're so hungry, then go make some Krabby Patties at the Krusty Krab! It's Sunday, Patrick. We're closed. This ain't no damn McDonald's! You'll work for Mr. Krabs! You never stop working! You gonna pay me, Conehead? I'll make you dinner. Just be patient before I make another hole in you with my- Make me some food, damn it! I could have been at home watching Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy! Or at the very least, be clapping Sandy Cheeks' cheeks! You mean you're you're gonna applaud Sandy's face? You know what I'm talking about, you moron. But I don't know what you're talking about. <sighs> yes, you do. You always act like the biggest idiot in town. What do you get out of it? Get out of what? My trousers? No, not that, you idiot! Hey, SpongeBob. I didn't know you were such a bossy guest. I'm not being bossy, Patrick. I'm just, look, we're friends, aren't we? Yes, SpongeBob. And friends are always 100% honest with each other, right? Yes, SpongeBob. So, if you were actually not as dumb as everyone thinks you are, would you tell me? Yes, SpongeBob. So... So what? So, is it all an act? Like, were you faking this whole time? <laughs> I'm not your ex, SpongeBob. Oh, tartar sauce! Just feed me already! Then feast your eyes on this! What the hell is this? Calm down, SpongeBob. I'm on a budget! You did it on purpose! You're playing dumb again! I've had it with you! I'm putting an end to this charade and finding out once and for all! But I swear I'm not- I'm gonna find out once and for all what you're hiding in that pink cone! I don't keep anything in there! It's empty, I swear! Lies! I bet you there's a million slave starfish bending to your will! giving their all to prop up your mental facilities. Also, you can do what with it? Nothing! Nothing at all! It's a disgrace I will stand for no longer! SpongeBob, you're scaring me! I don't know what you're saying! Shut up and hold still! Come on, come on, there's gotta be something in there. Where is it? Where is it? 
Stop! Stop it! Stop, stop it. squirming, you pansy! I want help! It hurts! This wouldn't be happening if you'd just been honest with me. Now, you regret it, don't you? I'm sorry. I'll do whatever you want. Just stop it! It's too late for that, Patrick. This is what you get. I think I feel something in there. Where'd it go? There it is! Now I've got you! <gasps> oh my god! What have I done? <laughs> and so goes the tale of how there once was a starfish named Patrick Star who lived under a rock. He was always believed to be the stupidest moron in all of Bikini Bottom, until his very best friend in the entire world took him for a dirty, rotten liar. And now, nobody will ever know how smart Patrick Starr could have been. Hopefully, if nothing else, Mr. Squarepants will learn a lesson from this, that you should probably just believe your friends when they say they're telling you the truth. At the very very least, don't try to tear someone's heart out. On the weekends, I used to go to this local gym with my boyfriend to work out. And while I tried taking gym sessions in the morning and afternoon, I didn't feel comfortable being around other men constantly checking me out. There were too many creeps at that gym, which forced me to work out at night where there were less people staring. There were a lot of perks going during the night because my boyfriend and I didn't have to wait in line just to use a machine or any workout equipment for that matter. At night, there was no front desk helper, so we had to punch ourselves in with a key card to get inside. My boyfriend was always there to spot me during my workouts or walk the treadmill next to mine. However, one night, as I was working on my last few sets of squats, a creepy older guy wearing a red polo t-shirt and blue jeans approached me. The guy didn't look like he belonged in the gym at all. If anything, he looked like he was the janitor of the gym. As I was midway through my set, the man asked if I needed a spot. I shook my head no, politely declining. But what creeped me out was how the man remained standing there. I could see his eyes scanning my body, making me feel uncomfortable. Then, moments later, he said, Come on, babe. Don't brush me off like that. You're hurting my feelings. And when my boyfriend noticed, he immediately intervened by stepping in between us and confronted the man. The creep didn't reply. Instead, he smirked and walked away, heading over to the lockers. My boyfriend put me at ease, reminding me I'd be safe as long as he was around. But unfortunately, it was only the beginning. The following night, I used the treadmill while my boyfriend was lifting weights on the other side of the gym. And since the treadmill section was near the windows, I could see whoever went in and out of the establishment. Man. Moments later, I spotted a familiar face riding a bike to the front of the gym, parking it there. As he approached the building, I caught him staring at me, smiling as he headed toward the door. I tried to ignore him, hoping he wouldn't approach me. However, eight minutes after entering the gym and changing into his gym clothes, he dashed to the treadmill area where there was no one else but him and me. At night, not a single staff member could be seen roaming this place. So, my muscles stiffened, tension crawling from my neck to my feet as I saw the man's reflection through the window. He was obviously checking me out since he could have chosen several other vacant treadmills. I politely asked the man if he had a problem with me. However, he just stood there smiling at me like he didn't hear a word I said. Unable to concentrate, I got off the treadmill and headed over to my boyfriend, not wanting to give the creep a front row seat. Annoyed, I told my boyfriend what was happening, but before my boyfriend could confront him, the man suddenly left the gym, hopping on his bike, and rode off into the street. Needless to say, my boyfriend and I were disturbed, knowing that he literally came in just to harass me. The next day, my boyfriend called me to tell me he couldn't work out with 
with me at the gym. Due to the overbearing amount of schoolwork he had, he sounded worried on the phone when he asked me if I was going to the gym without him. So, to put him at ease, I told him I would use the gym in the morning instead. About an hour later, I made my way to the gym and started warming up by doing some jumping jacks. It had not even been five minutes since I stepped foot in the gym yet. When I saw the creep from the corner of my eye once again, he then approached me, asking if I needed help with anything. So, again, I declined as calmly as I could, but as I did, he came closer, whispering lewd things into my ear like, Give me your baby. I felt violated. He constantly flirted as my body froze on the spot due to fear. Then, as I was about to leave, one of the most disturbing, gut-wrenching things happened. The man reached inside a brown bag, revealing a dangerous that made me go silent. He pointed it at me while simultaneously covering it with the bag. I was stunned, frozen, traumatized. I didn't know what to say or do except obey this guy's every command. That's when he said, What's wrong, honey? Cat got your tongue? You're now coming with me. He grabbed my arm, squeezing it tightly as he yanked me towards the exit. Unlike before, my boyfriend wasn't around to defend me, and at that moment, I realized how helpless I was. As we slowly approached the exit, I made eye contact contact with one of the workers, mouthing the words, Help me! Then, just when I thought all hope was lost, the worker abruptly stepped forward and yelled, Get your hands off of her! The creep was perplexed, letting me go immediately as he exited the gym and left on his bike again. Then, as we watched him leave, the worker consoled me as he asked about what had happened. I told him everything. He quickly called the cops and reported the incident. The police were able to immediately identify the suspect and find him a few hours later by a bus shelter. The cops arrested him and charged him with kidnapping, possession of an illegal firearm, and resisting arrest. I have since avoided going to public gyms, even if my boyfriend was around due to the trauma. But despite the man being locked away, another shocking revelation dawned on me. After further investigation, it was found out that the man had been stalking me since I joined the gym, and allegedly had around a dozen candid photos of myself and multiple younger women on his cell phone. This story was inspired by a true story that happened in 2017 at World Gym located in Lehigh Acres, Florida. A 45-year-old man named Luis was found guilty of kidnapping a woman. It was alleged that the man would constantly ask the female victim if she needed help working out, and when she refused his advances, he would say lewd things to her, which eventually led to what went down as portrayed in the animation. 